And Dee Dee, you'll continue to allow people in from the waiting room. I don't need to do that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And you just tell me when we're ready. I don't see. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session today <laughs> um, with Ms. Paula Pittman. Um, this, I'm Didi Mikasa from Comprehensive Services Center. I will be your host for today. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, just a little housekeeping, this workshop is gonna be for two hours. Um, we will have a brief 10 minute break at around 11 o'clock. Um, see uh, right now what we're going to do is I know people are still coming in meeting them. Um, we're going to ask that everybody um, turn off their video and then mute themselves um, just so that um, the presenter will have the bandwidth to run the, the presentation without any hiccups um, if anybody has any questions if we can ask that you use the chat feature um, and then Paula will make sure to um, save some time at the end to go ahead and, and address all the questions. Um, let's see here. Okay, and looks like everybody's Okay, I was gonna give it another minute, let everybody, okay. Looks like the waiting room is clear now. <laughs> okay. So today's session is going to be the impact of early experiences on the infant brain. Um, this is Paula Pittman. She's the director of Sky High and Deaf Mentor Outreach um, and Training Program at Sky High Institute at Utah State University. And she has served as a national trainer for the Sky High Institute since 1992. Um, she was a co creator of the Deaf Mentor Program and was involved in the development of the Sky High and Deaf Mentor Curriculum Manuals. Um, she has been involved in development of many program materials to support early intervention providers and parents who work with or are raising children with sensory disabilities. Um, as an early intervention practitioner, she has had an, the honor to serve families who have children who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf plus, deaf blind, and deaf or visually impaired since 1982. Um, Paula? Okay, thanks for that introduction. Uh, so I just have to start this by saying it's extremely awkward uh, to do a presentation where I see no one but me and the wonderful interpreter. Um, so I'm used to kind of uh, seeing my participants uh, so if it seems a little weird and stilted, that's almost like I need to invite someone over to sit at my table so that I can have a conversation. Um, I'm more of a conversation person. I'm not a good COVID person because I'm a, a people person. And um, this uh, engaging only with a computer is a little bit more challenging for me. But um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I wish I could see all your faces. At the very end, when we open things up for um, questions, I do hope I can see people. I hope you'll open up your cameras so that um, I can see folks and uh, know who you are. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, though. I'm going to share my screen right now with my uh, PowerPoint, and we're going to get started talking about the infant brain. So this is one of my um, absolute favorite topics to talk about. Um, because uh, the infant brain was really our brains period were sort of uh, something that we had no access to for many, many years. We didn't really know what happened in our brains. We knew we used them to think, but we didn't know anything else. And since the 90s, in the, in the 90s, they really came out with high level uh, brain imagery technology that has opened a whole new world of study um, to us. And we're still learning about the brain. Um, this is really not a, an area that we have all the information in the world, but we are learning information as we go. So 
we're going to just jump right into this. And I, what I'm going to do uh, today is just we're going to start out with the infant brain and what's going on with the brain. And then we're going to break it down into some things you can do. This presentation was really designed more for parents, but it'll work for anyone. We're going to share some ideas you can do to help grow a baby's brain. So I'm going to start with this precious picture of this little tiny baby. And, um, you know, we look at babies like that and, and you know, they're just so calm and serene and quiet and beautiful. And often, and for many years, and still today, some people look at these babies, these precious babies, and they think, eh, they're just little lumps of clay. You know, they sleep, they eat, they poop, and then they repeat. Um, and pee too, you know. So they re repeat the cycle. But for many years, we thought babies really weren't really taking in information that their brains just weren't really that active. But what we know is that babies really are very active from the minute they're born. Their brains are taking in new information and they're finding ways to express what they're feeling and experiencing to us. Um, so all of these babies, their brains are moving at a rapid pace. So that infant brain is actually constantly always working. It's constantly taking in information and processing that information. And that early activity, what's happening in the, especially in the first really three years of life, but all the way up to the first six years of life, all that's happening in the brain and with that baby is creating really the foundation for every piece of information that will be stored in that brain for the rest of our lives. Um, so interestingly enough, the baby, the infant brain, when a baby's born, um, their organs are actually like um, just a mini version of what that organ's going to be for the rest of that baby's life. So baby has a tiny little heart. That heart is functioning just as it will, as it will until the day it stops. Um, those kidneys are functioning fully from the time that baby is born. But the brain is a different organ brain is functioning, but the infant brain is only about a quarter of the size of an adult brain at birth. So that baby, the brain is there, the, the core functions of the brain, the, the areas of the brain that uh, help the baby to breathe and to process, all of those, those networks are there. There's a, an auditory cortex, there's a language cortex, there's a visual cortex, a motor cortex, all of those cortexes, all of those areas of the brain are alive and functioning, but that brain is really just waiting to grow. So only a, only a quarter of the size of the brain is at birth. That's how tiny it is. But when that baby, even though the brain isn't developed, when the baby is born, all of those neurons or cells that the baby needs to develop a fully functioning uh, brain is there. They're, re they're just hanging out. They're hanging out there in the brain, waiting for direction to, to make, make, make their way through this brain highway to the areas of the brain where they're going to function for the rest of their lives. So their babies are born with about, okay, get the number. I don't know how I can even understand this number, but they have about a hundred billion cells or neurons at birth that are just hanging out. They're not connected to these functioning networks that are already in the brain. So they're just, they're waiting for something to happen so they can begin to move in the direction they need to go. So from birth to age three, that infant brain goes from having a hundred billion brain cells that are unconnected to having over 1000 billion connections. Now I can't even wrap my head around a billion. Like if someone says they have a billion dollars, I have no idea how much money that is. I can't even go there, but a thousand billion. So there are billions of connections that happen or synapses that are created within the networks in the brain in the first three years of life. So that baby's brain is actively moving, even though we don't see it. The infant brain makes about 700 synaptic connections every second in response to the experiences in their life. So if you hook a baby up to brain imagery technology, 
this is kind of what it looks like in there. So they put tiny little electrodes on the baby's brain and expose them to activities. And they can see that baby's brain light up. They can even actually watch these neurons or these cells travel along those little pathways. You see those little look like little roadways that go from one big dot to another big dot. Those are actually neuronal pathways that these cells, these neurons travel along. And as they travel through, they make a synaptic connection so that the pathway continues to grow. And once one neuron goes through, then others can follow along behind it. And so all of those cells in the brain that need to be connected to a system will make their way through this pathway, these pathways that are running through the brain and they, they happen all day, every day. So there are 700 neurons moving every second um, that a baby is alive. So that baby's brain is very, very active and growing. The process is so rapid and phenomenal that by the age of three years, the typical child's brain will go from a quarter of a typical adult size brain to two thirds of its adult size in three years of life. The human brain develops more rapidly in the first year of life than at any other time in human development. So here is a chart of infant brain growth rate. So like we said before, at birth, a baby's brain is about a quarter the size of an adult brain. In the first year of life, that baby's brain will double in size. By age three, about 80% of the brain growth is completed that will happen for a child in their life. And by six, 90% of brain growth is completed. So you can see in that first year of life, that's the most active time for a baby's brain, but it continues to be extremely active. What we call neuronal plasticity is happening in that brain. That brain is able to move and adjust and grow. So we can actually impact how intelligent a baby is going to be. We can impact how large that brain will grow um, by a variety, in a variety of ways. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So an infant, this is an infant in their first year of life, they learn more in one month of life than a typical adult learns in five years. That's how much that baby's brain is growing. So I think we think about learning as, you know, book learning, or um, maybe you learn a new language, but you have to think about what a baby, when a baby is born, nothing in the world is, is aware to them, it's nothing, nothing they've ever seen or done or touched. Everything is new. So when a baby is born, they are processing all of this new information. And all of that is being passed through the brain and creating these pathways that will eventually help that baby to understand what's happening in the world. So um, the brain is grown or developed through consistent routines or doing something again and again and again. So how many of you, and I can't see your hands, but I'll show that you think about it. How many of you have seen like a, a movie like, I don't know, Moana, 90 million times because your toddler, they wanted to see it again and again and again and again. Or you've read the same book. I don't know, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. So many times that you can say it, quote it in your sleep right? What's happening, the reason that baby needs to see it again and again, and the reason they want to do it again and again is that that brain is learning. It's practicing. It's picking up new information. All these pathways are happening in the brain. That's why babies repeat. They'll repeat, repeat, repeat. We really see it when they learn how to crawl, how to roll, all those motor skills, how to cruise, how to walk, They'll do the same thing over and over and over and over. What they're doing is creating neuronal pathways. So that brain is learning. That's why we're repeating, repeating, doing again and again and again. Same with acquisition of language. How do children learn language? They learn it because they hear you or they see you sign it. 
sign a word again or a sentence again and again consistently in a daily routine. When it happens again and again and again, those pathways are being traveled by these neuronal cells, creating synapses and helping us to learn. Okay, so do you wanna see some neurons in action? This is really cool technology. We can actually see brain cells moving in the brain of an infant. So hopefully this video will work. Ah, there we go. So the, the areas that are lit up are actually neurons. Those are cells and you see when it turns a bright yellow, they're creating synaptic or almost like an electrical connection. So these are paths of neurons moving along neural pathways and moving into areas of the brain where they will connect to full systems. Isn't that cool? I just find that completely fascinating. Um, and interesting, that number one, that we can track it, and number two, that it's happening. That is actually what's happening in a baby's brain all the time. So when you see a baby and they're doing something, you can sometimes see, see those wheels in their brain turning. It's like, okay, now we know there really is activity going on there. Those cells are actually, those neurons are moving through the brain and, and connecting into these established systems in our brain. But this process of growth, it doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't just boom. Um, so we, we've seen babies, um, sadly, and there's, there's video out there that you can watch, but it always makes me sad to watch it. But they have video of children in Romania um, that uh, were basically held in care facilities um, early on in their lives uh, during a regime in Romania where uh, they had a, a horrible dictator. And these babies were kept in care facilities like orphanages, but they were instructed, the people that were over these orphanages were instructed not to touch the babies. They cared for them, they gave them baths, they fed them, but they didn't give them any love, any attention, any instruction, any opportunities. And so those children were basically um, like couldn't walk, um, they couldn't crawl, they were, had been stuck in beds and, and they had developed a series of um, negative behaviors that provided them with some sort of stimulation. That's because the, that brain, if it's just that baby is left alone, the brain doesn't develop in the way it needs to. So I'm not, we're not gonna watch um, this movie. I do have a movie that we can watch, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the link into your chat so you can go and watch it. If we have time at the end, we'll go back and watch it. I just found out about the break time and I wanna be able to honor that and give you your break, but that means I have to cut something out. So I'm gonna cut out the little movie, but, but we can still, we're still gonna talk about how do those, how do we help that brain to develop fully? And how do we help those neurons to connect to functioning networks? Now, the interesting thing about the brain is we have all these hundreds of billions of cells, right? Like we talked about, they're waiting to make their way to a pathway to a connected functioning system in the brain, like the auditory system or the motor system. Um, if babies don't use those brains, if we don't give them experiences and opportunities to grow their brain, then all of those cells that are just hanging out there between the ages and four, and four of six, between the ages of four and six, those neurons, those cells will be pruned out. The body will just get rid of them. So what the baby has left is, you know, all that they got based on their early experiences. So when we talk about how do we grow a baby's brain, there are really three pillars that we look at that they, that people talk about, about building the child's brain. A lot of the information I'm sharing with you here uh, comes from a book called uh, Brain Rules for Babies by John Medina. If you don't have the book, I'd really recommend that you get it. It's a really interesting book talking about the 
reality of how do we help a baby's brain become all it can be. But, uh, and three of the pillars he talks about are here, these three, love, enriching, interactive, and meaningful experiences, and then a safe and consistent environment. We're gonna break down each one of these. We're gonna talk about each one of these um, individually. But these are the three pillars that you wanna have built into your daily life. Okay, so we'll start with love, all right? We all, we always, we know what love is, right? But for a baby, from a baby's perspective, love means what? It means people time. Baby brains are meant to take in information in three dimensions. So we think, well, we'll give the baby a computer screen or we'll let them look at the phone or watch the TV. We actually may be doing damage to a baby's brain by doing, giving them too much um, screen time because baby's brains are designed to learn in three dimensions. When you give them one dimension, it rewires that baby's brain. So what babies need is not video time. It doesn't mean they can't Zoom with grandma and grandpa or FaceTime with aunts and uncles and have a few minutes on a screen or watch a screen for a period of time. But what it means is that babies really, to grow their brain, they need time with humans. They need time with people face-to-face, -face, engaging, communicating, interacting. Babies need sufficient attention. So love is a lot of attention, really. When you love a baby, you, you, babies take a lot of work. They take a lot of attention and they need touch. We're gonna talk about touch in depth in just a minute. So they need that attention. They need touch. They need people to bond with, especially at least one caregiver. They need to have one consistent person in their life that they bond with and that baby needs to know that they're special. Um, every being needs to know that they matter, that they're loved. When we feel loved, we feel like it's worthwhile to fight these fights. It's worthwhile to feel this stress. And babies are no different. Um, because they can't do for themselves, they really do rely on caregivers. Um, so my favorite thing in the world is when I have friends or a family or someone I know who has a new baby. And I ask them, how's your baby? And their face just lights up like a Christmas tree. That's the kind of love that babies need, right? How many of you have someone or had someone in your life who when you walked in the room, they lit up like a Christmas tree? That kind of love makes you feel valuable, makes you feel like worthwhile. That's the kind of love that babies need. They also need that one-on-one -on -one predictable response of care. So they need to know that they will be fed. They need to know that their diaper will be changed, that when they cry, someone's going to come and take care of them, that their communication, what they are telling other people is responded to. And they need communication all the time. <clears throat> now, we have in our field, you know, and when you have a baby that's deaf or when you're a professional in the field of deaf education, um, we have this drama around communication modalities and methodologies um, that every family faces, that every professional deals with. And we're not gonna get into that today. I, I think we spend too much time and energy talking about modalities. What really matters in the lives of any baby, but especially our kiddos who are deaf or hard of hearing is, does your baby have full access to language? Now babies communicate with us from the minute they're born and we communicate back to them. They communicate with us without words, right? I mean, I, um, I love to communicate with babies. They're fascinating to me. They're such creative, communicative creatures at, at birth really. But I like in, in the old days before COVID, um, I love to travel in the airport. I would sit in the airport and I watch for babies. I will actually sit down in the airport behind a family that has a baby and just wait for them to lift that baby up over their shoulder so that then that baby and I are looking at each other. And we have a full conversation, me and that baby from across the aisle without ever saying a word. 
right? And you've all done it, right? Babies, you light up. If you do, what do babies do? Their eyes go, hey, that person is talking to me. That person's communicating with me. So we have to be aware of that baby's communication. They're gonna use their bodies, their faces. They're gonna use their voices to communicate with us until they have words or signs. But our focus needs to be, how is this baby getting full access to language? If you have a baby that's profoundly deaf and they don't have amplification yet, they don't have a cochlear implant or their hearing aids don't give them full access to spoken language, we need to find other ways for that baby to have access to language. Doesn't mean they have to you know, use sign language forever or that they'll use spoken language forever. Um, that can be, that can vary, but the baby needs access to language and they need to be communicated with 24 seven, no matter what. If we focus on that and not the methodology debate, then we'll have healthier babies, okay? Um, and then they need to be engaged in interactive play. So love is interactive play. It's that engagement. Love also creates for our kids when we give them that constant love. Kids have a psychological shield that'll help them, help them to deal with life stresses. Um, and you know what I mean when, when I say this. So like if a baby is well-loved, and they feel safe with, with a caregiver. Let's say you're out on a playground, that baby falls down and scratches their elbow. What are they gonna do? They find mom or dad or their caregiver immediately and they make a beeline to that person. Why? Because that person has created a shield for them. They know they're loved. That love is gonna protect this baby. They're gonna be calm. They know they're gonna be safe. They feel upset. And that's what love does. It gives that baby a way to feel, I have a place where I can be protected. So that allows the baby to go out and explore and fall and try new things and get hurt, but then has a place, a safe place to come back and be protected and nurtured so that they can build up enough strength, enough courage to go out and do it again and try something new to take risks. It gives that child, love gives a child the sense of being valued, that they're important, that they're worthwhile. It helps to create that healthy sense of self-esteem and self-worth. I think we have been taught maybe falsely that what we wanna do is tell the child that they're pretty or they're smart, you're so smart, you know, you're so whatever. And really what we wanna tell the baby is you're loved no matter what, you're gonna fail. You're gonna have some times when things don't go well. Maybe you don't look good in that particular outfit. It doesn't matter, you're loved no matter what for who you are, for the person that you are. So that your wealth comes from within. Um, your value to me as your caregiver is that you exist. Um, that's what love gives children is the sense of self-worth which then leads to a sense of confidence. Um, loves get, love gives children, like I said before, the strength, the courage to try new things, to take a risk, and then to back up and say, you know, even if I failed at that, I'm still worthwhile, and I can take what I learned and do something different. That's what love provides to children. It's also that strong base for that healthy emotional growth, um, that I'm loved, that I can learn how other people feel. I can develop empathy um, and I can develop my thinking skills. And that goes again, back to the brain, that brain development. So love is the first thing that babies need for their brains to begin to grow and develop for us to, to help establish a, a baby's environment and the people around them so that they don't have stress in their lives so that their brain can learn and take in new information. So during COVID and we're talking about love and, and giving kids what they need, this is what life looks like for a lot of us right now <laughs> during this COVID time. It's a blurry picture, but you get the idea. Um, the kids are screaming. They haven't been out in three months if you're like, Hawaii, y'all have nice weather. I live in Utah. 
in Utah, we've had, it's winter. Um, so we're not always able to get outside and play. Um, so we're all kind of tied inside our houses um, and we often need time away. But what often happens is like in this picture here, this mother is totally disconnected from her child. A mom is on a screen. The baby's playing, they're engaging. Now I know you can't engage with your kids 24 seven. But especially with COVID, because we're relying on our screens to do everything in our lives right now. But what I'm worried about is, is that this may carry over into uh, our lives after COVID. And we know this was life before COVID too. Um, or this family, this one really breaks my heart. Look at this baby. This baby is just, he's waiting. That brain is just sitting there going, I'm ready to learn but both of his caregivers are totally engaged with their screens instead of being engaged with their baby. That one breaks my heart, right? Cause he's, and look how happy he's content. He could be getting so much other information to grow that brain. This little guy, now what we see here, that face to me looks, I don't know, angry or frustrated, maybe sad because he looks like he's doing something engaging, but instead of his dad um, interacting with him, he's interacting with his phone, right? interacting with his screen. The last one, the meal time, right? We could be having a conversation, dad's reading the paper. So it's not always screens, right? It can be all kinds of things that take our attention away from children. And these, you can see these children are all under the age of six. These are kids who, this is their brain time. This is it. The first six years of life, that's when that brain is being developed. So maybe shifting in our minds, how can we balance the life of screens and books and things we have to do and take advantage of these six years or the first three years, these early years of life when the brain is so primed for information. What we're teaching kids here, I'm afraid, is that we're teaching kids to engage with technology instead of engaging with humans. And computers don't love us. Phones don't love us. Um, they don't create an environment in the brain to grow that baby's brain to its full potential. Um, so this is a baby who's engaged in a lot of good technology, but that's not human interaction. As opposed to these families. So let's take a look here at all of these families, all doing different things, but all in, in engaged in different, maybe have toys, they may have some food, but mostly it's human engagement eye-to-eye -eye contact, touch, um, smiles, laughter, probably some turn-taking if we could see it happening, right? And look at the baby, this, the baby, the tiny baby at the bottom with the mom, that's a face that's lit up like a Christmas tree, right? You see that face, that mom, that baby's reading that face and saying, yeah, I'm, I am a loved creature. Um, I'm worthwhile, I'm valuable. These are the kinds of loving engagements we want to have with our kids. So love for babies, love is touch, right? So look at these, all these babies getting loving, nurturing touch. And touch is important. Um, love is important. Um, Making eye contact, how do we show that love? The one is through touch. Uh-oh, I think I hit the wrong button. Uh -oh. Sorry guys, let's go back here. We missed a slide. So um, love is touch for babies. So this is the important thing to remember about touch is our skin is the largest organ in our body, right? It is an organ, our skin is an organ. Um, and it's for babies, it's their most intact sense at birth. Babies sense everything early on through touch. 
um, that touch, that nurturing touch that we saw in this picture, this beautiful touch between parents or caregivers and their babies, that touch helps a baby to feel safe. So when we talk about love before, love equals touch for a baby. So holding a baby, comforting a baby, really caressing that baby, um, Real, especially, I'm, uh, and we talk about it again here later, but rubbing a baby's head. I love to rub a baby's head. I love those newborn heads. Um, well, we find out that actually touching and rubbing that baby's head actually enhances that baby's growth. Um, so touching that baby makes them feel safe. It's the one thing they understand um, when they're born is touch. Touch can calm them. It's safe. It's warm. It's comfortable. When we touch a baby, hold a baby, it reduces the stress in the baby and in the caregiver. And it strengthens that caregiver child bond. So when you touch, you hold your baby, when you look into your baby's eyes, there's something that happens when we look into someone's eyes that we actually fall in love with them. That looking into a human's eyes, that connection with touch is very powerful in a human. Um, babies, uh, this was a study done many years ago, but they, they studied babies who got shots in hospitals. And what they do is they measured a baby's cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone that we all produce. We've probably all heard about cortisone. Babies who sat on the laps of their mothers when they got their vac vaccinations, those babies would cry and they still had stress, but their stress levels were significantly lower than children who were set on a table or in a chair to get their vaccinations. It was just the touch alone, a touch of a, of a loved caregiver holding that child during the shot that reduced the child's stress. So there's evidence, um, scientific evidence that holding a baby, touching a baby um, actually reduces the level of stress in a baby. And that's good because babies don't really know yet how to handle stress. A lot of adults don't know how to handle stress. We pick all kinds of weird ways to handle that stress. But touch also increases that deep sleep in babies. Um, the more babies are touched, the more comforted they are, um, the better they sleep and the longer they sleep. So they sleep in a deeper state and they sleep longer. Our brains need sleep in order to grow. Um, rest, so sleep and a healthy diet help to create what they call myelinization in those uh, synaptic pathways. Myelinization is like, um, it's a fatty tissue, but basically what it does is it allows um, those neurons to travel through the brain much faster when you have good, strong myelinization. So kind of think of it like a subway, you know, you've got the, the tube and then the, the train that travels along the subway. Um, so that tube, you know, if you have track in it, it travels faster. If you don't have track, it's not gonna go anywhere. So myelinization is basically the track that's laid down. That myelinization is created by good restful sleep and a good healthy diet. And good healthy fats in, in a baby's diet. Um, and even in our diets, because myelinization continues to happen in our brains until around the age, uh, about middle age, but we still have neuronal development throughout our lives. Um, touch also lowers that risk of depression in babies because it lowers the cortisol levels. And then it is, we know it's an essential part of happiness. One of the hardest things for me during coronavirus has been, I, I can't hug people, you know, I'm a hugger. Um, so we're missing out on that touch, you know, just to hug folks and well, it's been hard to not have that on a regular basis, right? So it's essential to our well-being. We know that when we uh, give hugs to others, when we touch others in, in a positive way, um, that it builds, uh, releases hormones, it releases, um, uh, endocrine, is that right? I'm trying to remember what the, the chemical is in our bodies, but it makes it, it's a feel good 
um, a feel good chemical in our bodies that's released when we give hugs, we get hugs. Um, so showing love every day, how do we do it? How do you do it? Make eye contact with your baby throughout the day, all day throughout the day. Play with your baby or your child. I'm, I'm talking about little ones, but actually throughout childhood, these are things we can do with our kids. Use that loving touch, kisses. Um, if you got a little one using infant massage, um, there are a lot of websites you can go to to know how to do infant massage, but basically just loving touch, you know, rubbing your baby with lotion after you take them out of the bath is that good infant massage, that good connection between you and the baby. Rubbing that baby's head, my favorite thing, that gentle comforting touch throughout the day. If the baby is stressed out or you're in a new situation, just putting your hand on the baby's leg or on their arm or their belly so that they know someone's there. I'm here. Um, someone's connected to me. Someone's taking care of me. Communicate with your baby all day, every day throughout the day. And then stay close to them. You know, if you've got to do your dishes in the, live, in the kitchen, bring the baby in in their carrier or put them in a high chair or put them somewhere they're close to you so you can talk to them and engage with them while you're doing dishes or while you're fixing dinner. So you're staying engaged with them, talking to them about what you're doing. Okay, so love, that's the first thing we can do. The second thing, our time, okay, we're doing good. The second thing is to provide enriching, interactive and meaningful experiences um, to your child. So really, that love, that foundation that you give to the baby allows them that safe space, right? They know they're loved. They know they're protected. The next thing we do is provide lots of opportunities. So let's talk about what those might look like. Okay. Um, interactions with people. So we've already talked about how important people are. That's part of love, but it's also the interaction piece as well. Um, so what does that look like? Um, so we talk about, you'll hear in, uh, through, throughout websites and even the video that I'm going to show you guys, if we have time at the end, they talk about turn taking or what they call now catch and return. That basically just means I'm going to do something and you're going to respond. So if we have a conversation, you're a friend of mine, I call you up, I'm going to you know, might say, hey, how was your day? What did you do today? They'll talk and they say, hey, what did you do? you do today? And go back and forth. Same thing with babies. Before they can talk, what do they do? How do they communicate? With their bodies, with their voices, right? They don't have words, but that's how they communicate. So maybe the baby hits the table and you hit the table back. That's catch and return. They do something, you do something in response to them and back and forth. Uh, same thing with language. They, maybe they say, ba, 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 and you say, oh, you want your bottle? You want your bottle? And then we wait for them to reach for it or shake their hands or kick their feet in excitement or smile. Yeah, you want your bottle. We give it to them and, oh, it's cold. You know, they respond. So it's this back and forth turn taking that's catch and return. So we can do that just with everyday life, um, interactions throughout the day with the baby. I think right now, a lot of times we just go through routines. You know, it's like, okay, we're gonna we'll give the baby the bath. Okay, we just gotta get it done. So you fill up the tub, uh, you give the baby the bath, you don't really play, you don't engage, you just let's get you cleaned out and put, we're running late, it's time to get you to bed put the clothes on, we put the baby to bed and there's not a lot of interaction. So what we wanna do is step back from that and say, how can we add five more minutes and have some really enriching interactions, some catch and return in this activity. You can also do it through simple interactive games. I listed a few here, ones that we all know, like peekaboo, that's a great turn-taking game. You can start with babies when they're tiny and you move the blanket, cover them up or cover up your own face. And, and then as they get older, they'll play with you. They'll do it themselves. They get into that game and know this is something we can take turns with. 
or this little piggy, you know, playing with their little toes. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home, right? Um, and pausing in between this little piggy went to market. <sighs> pausing and waiting to see what the baby does. This little piggy stayed home, right? So that kind of engagement or the itsy bitsy spider. Some of these songs have, or games have, it's kind of a song, you know, itsy bitsy spider, it's a song. Went up the water, it, but it has little hand motions that you can do with kids so that you're engaging. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a game, kind of a song, but there are a lot of interactive songs like twinkle, twinkle, little star, or the wheels on the bus go round and round, right? Um, and the hokey pokey, my personal favorite. It's an old, that's an old song. I don't even know if people really do it anymore, but that is such a fun song. It teaches babies body parts, teaches movement. And the more babies move, movement is part of brain growth. You know, as babies move, they're creating new synapses. So if we can connect, this connects language and human interaction and movement all at the same time. You can probably think of if we were live and I could see all of you, I'd ask you what other games, what other things do you do? What other songs? What are some that uh, your baby likes more than any others? If you think of some, put them in the chat so that everybody can benefit from them. Um, I think some, uh, I work with some families today who no one really did these songs with them. And they're really fantastic uh, songs for uh, babies to be involved with for parents to do with their kids or even siblings. Um, okay, so at the core of interaction really and engaging with your child is language. Language and communication, we talked about it before, but what we do early on in our baby's lives are really gonna build that foundation of language. What we know from research is the more words that a baby hears in a meaningful situation throughout the day, the better their language is when they get ready to go to school. They do better academically. They're better readers. So exposure to more vocabulary, exposure to language, exposure to words is really essential for our kids. All kids, whether they're deaf or hard of hearing, all kids. So the one thing we want to do is talk or sign, communicate, cute speech, whatever it is you're using. You want to use language with your baby all day long throughout the day. That doesn't mean we talk at a baby, blah, 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 blah. No, it's this catch and return. I say something, I wait for you to respond. Sometimes I'll say something without a response. Maybe I just want to comment about something. Um, these two next two things really are just essential. If you can do these two things, you're going to be building language in your, in your baby's brain. You're going to help them to learn language. The first one is to talk about what your baby is doing. What are they doing? Are they sitting? Oh, you're sitting up. Oh, you're touching the blanket. Oh, you're looking at the fan. Are you watching the light? Okay, you're talking about what your baby is doing, what they're seeing, what they're feeling. Oh, do you feel your blankie? It's so soft. Oh, did you find your bunny? Oh, you love your bunny. Look at his ears, right? So we're just, what that baby's feeling, um, what they're touching, what they're hearing, what they're experiencing. Um, oh, that's a loud noise. That's scary. I'm so sorry. That's a scary noise. It's okay. Then it's, and for some of us, that's easy to do. It's easier to talk about what the baby's doing, but we also have to talk about what we're doing. Talk about what you're doing. Washing dishes. Mom's washing the dishes. This water is so hot. I'd let you touch it, but it's too hot. Hot. Um, or mom's washing dishes and look, there are bubbles. Look at the bubbles. Taking the bubbles, letting the baby touch it. Do you feel those bubbles? Pop, 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 pop. And then you go back to washing your dishes, right? 
or maybe dad's planting bulbs out in the flower garden. Okay, bring the baby out there, bring him in his little seat in his carrier. If you've got a toddler, have him come sit with a chair and dig with you. And, you know, dad can say, oh, we're going to dig through this dirt is so hard. Hmm. I wonder what we can do to soften up the dirt. Maybe if we put some water, you think water will help? Wait for the baby to take turns. So commenting, talking about what you're thinking, what you're touching, what you're hearing, what you're experiencing. It's a lot of talking. It's a lot of talking. So if you're not really comfortable talking, you know, I always ask families I work with on a scale from one to 10, with one being, I hardly ever talk, to 10 being, I talk all the time. Where do you fall on that scale? Let's say you're a five, then I say, can we bump from a five to a six? Let's just bump up one level. And that's that many more words, that many more sentences, that many more experiences that your child is acquiring language to match what he's doing, feeling, seeing, thinking, experiencing, or him understanding that me as mom, you as dad, grandma, auntie, uncle, all of us have thoughts and feelings and we're talking about those. That's all a way to give babies access to language and that is building the brain, building those pathways in the brain. Okay, we already talked about turn taking. Okay, so we are at, at actually, let's pause right now. It's 153. So um, I was told to take 153 my time. So that's, I think, uh, I don't know, 1153 your time. I'm not sure what time it is. Um, but I was told to take a break for about 10 minutes, halfway through. So it's 153. Let's take a break till would be 203 for me and I need help maybe from you guys to interpret two two hours three hours behind me whatever you are <laughs> so um so we will come back let's put it this way come back three minutes after the next hour three minutes after the hour 1103 thank you 1103 all right take a little break enjoy your break We are um, three minutes after the hour. So I think we're ready to start. I hope we're ready to start. Um, I can't see anyone's feedback, so I'm gonna go ahead and start and hopefully everyone, everyone's here and ready. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen again. And just keep on going. So, all right, we talked about these little games. Um, we talked about this. All right, so the next thing um, that is a part really of these uh, good interactions and exchanges with your baby um, is focusing on emotions. So I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about emotions because I think sometimes um, some of us feel like children, our, our children were sent to us to uh, destroy us <laughs> because they do things that just make us crazy. 
But again, I think the, the trick to um, developing empathy and being an empathetic parent or even a, a teacher or care provider is to be willing to enter your child's world um, on a regular basis and to empathize with what your child is feeling. I often talk with parents who are really frustrated with their children because of their behavior. Um, and I, I like to tell parents, and I'm gonna have you think about this too. Think about the life of, a, let's say an 18 month old. All right, if you're 18 months old, what choices do you really have in your life? What control do you have over your life? You think about that for a minute. If we were live, I'd ask you to share. But think about what kind of, what things can an 18 year old control? I mean, 18 month old control. They don't really, you know, they don't get to pick what they eat, really. Um, the things that they can really control are whether they eat something. Um, if you're a little bit older and you're trying to potty train, they can control whether they will go on the potty or not. Um, they can control whether they go to sleep or not. You know, they can force themselves to stay awake. But really in their world, there's very little that they can control. Um, so if you can give babies choices, even little ones throughout the day, do you want peas or do you want applesauce? Even if they pick the wrong one, oh, you don't like that one? You wanna try the peas instead? Giving babies those little choices as they get a little older, do you wanna wear red today or you wanna wear blue today? Um, we can give babies choices throughout the day and toddlers and children choices throughout the day that give them some sense of power and control in their lives. If I could see you, I would, I would ask this, I'm gonna ask this question, but how many of you don't like to have any control in your lives? I guess no one, I would assume no one has their hand up. We all like to feel like we have some sense of control in our lives. I think that's why maybe this pandemic has been even harder than we could even imagine because there's so little we can really control. That's how babies live all the time. They live in a world where they don't have a lot of control. If we can understand and empathize with that, we can try to put ourselves in their place. Okay, we're trying to learn how to walk. It's got to be frustrating. You see everybody walking and you know you want to do that, but you can't make your body do it. So that when that baby is babies between nine and 12 or 13 months of age, 14 months of age while they're learning to walk, they're, they're, irrit they're just irritable. They're irritable because they want to achieve this skill. They, they're using all the energy they have to learn that skill. Um, and it makes them grumpy, right? It makes them grumpy about everything else because they can't achieve what they want. And all their energy, their cortisol levels are high. All their energy is going to that one task. So if we can understand that as a parent or a teacher or a caregiver, we understand they're under stress and that's why they're behaving that way. It makes us much more empathetic where we don't get angry when their behaviors go out of control, right? So, and, and remembering, thinking that babies, like they don't know they're not supposed to touch the TV, you know? They don't know that if they push that glass vase over, it's gonna break into a million pieces. Babies don't know that. Um, that's what early life is. That's what raising children is, is teaching them if you do that, this happens, that there are consequences and there are some things we can do. And if we do them, it's a good thing. And some things, if we do them, it's a bad thing. So, but the, the best way to understand that is to step back and put yourself in your baby's shoes or in your child's shoes. How do you think they might be feeling right now and dealing with them with more empathy instead of just, um, you know, discipline or anger. Uh, really effective parents know that there's no such thing as a bad emotion or a good emotion. Um, you know, their emotions just exist. So effective parents seem to know that those emotions don't make a person weak or strong. They're, they only make a person human. That's what emotions do. They make you human. 
And your baby feels all these emotions. You feel emotions too. And it's good to begin early on recognizing what those emotions are so that the baby understands what I'm feeling. Because when, you know, when you get frustrated or angry, like I turn into a little green monster when I'm driving my car, people just make me crazy, right? I'm very calm otherwise. We get in the car and it's like, oh my gosh, why did you pull in front of me? I turn into this green monster, right? So it's good to see those emotions and go, all right, I'm angry. This is why I, I need to take it down a notch. It doesn't really matter what happens in this car. I need to breathe and step back, recognize the emotion is there. Our babies, we need to help them to recognize their emotions. There was a study done many years ago now um, where they uh, showed children between the ages of seven and 14 who were deaf or hard of hearing, multiple pictures of people's faces expressing different emotions. And they asked these children to label the emotions that they are seeing in these pictures. 80% of the kids labeled the emotions with three different emotions. You can probably guess what they were, happy, mad, or sad. Now, how sad would it be to go, or depressing maybe, to go through life knowing only those three emotions, could label only those three emotions? We have such a broad spectrum of emotions. So we wanna to talk to our babies about what they're feeling and expand. So if a baby is frustrated or angry, angry we can, it doesn't mean you give in to them and let them have whatever they want. It just means we label it and say, I can see you're frustrated. I would be angry too, but we can't have candy right now. Instead, we can have yogurt, okay? So recognizing where the baby's emotions are coming from, labeling those emotions, and recognizing that they're just, it's part of the human experience. By six months of age, babies, they uh, experience and express surprise, disgust, happiness, sadness, anger, fear. They'll match the emotions of other people. If a baby starts to cry, a baby at six months begins to have that empathy um, and they'll cry too. Or if someone's upset and stressed, you'll see that baby experience that same stress. Um, so babies begin to empathize early on. We need to empathize with them. Often, even though babies have all of these emotions, they really don't know how to express big emotions. And so we see, and we see adults do this too, right? So um, they may act angry when really they're sad or afraid. Uh, they may be violent uh, in their behaviors, may have a temper tantrum maybe, or bite or kick when they're jealous or grumpy or when they're hungry. Okay, so helping parents or having parents help and, and teachers help, we help the baby identify the emotion that they're expressing. Um, okay, I can see you're, you're angry right now. Are you hungry? Is that why you feel angry? Are you bored? Is that why you're kicking your brother? Um, so talking to children about their emotions helps them to grow up to be more empathic adults. We want children to be able to understand the emotions of others and share in their grief. That starts with us as parents, us as teachers. If we show empathy to a child, they learn how to show empathy to others and label those emotions for them. That's all a part of the interacting and building that brain. Um, emotions teach empathy. It's so powerful that it actually can change the developing nervous systems of infants. When uh, parents are really empathic and concerned and can join in in their child's emotion, it calms that child's nervous system, makes them less anxious, less worried, less frustrated, less frantic. It doesn't, empathy doesn't require a solution, right? I can say, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss. I don't have to solve anything. All I'm doing is understanding. I'm so sorry you're frustrated. I know that must be so hard for you. I don't have to fix it. I just have to recognize it. That recognition, that labeling of emotions builds those brain pathways. Um, empathy not only matters, but it really is a foundation for effective parenting. 
um, good empathic parents uh, raise good empathic children. Okay. Um, so the other thing we can do to build those pathways and under the, the pillar of interactions um, and experiences is to talk with your baby. We've talked about this already, but uh, to communicate using language with your baby and good communication skills all day, every day in child activities. And here's a few of them. These are things we do all the time, right? How many times in a day do you change a baby's diaper? I mean, really hundreds, thousands of times in the baby's life, you're gonna change a diaper. Now just think if you have sets of language that you can use around diaper change, how much language that baby can use. You have their rapt attention for a very short period of time, many times throughout the day. Um, meal time is a time when we can talk about all kinds of foods and textures and all kinds of things, getting dressed, um, talking about buttons and zippers and plaid and polka dots and um, rough clothes. Corduroy is rough and um, our leggings are smooth. You know, um, all the language that can be built around that day. Um, bath time, uh, talking about bath toys, about the textures in the tub, about hot and cold, about bubbles and the language is never ending, but we tend to get in ruts, right? Where we'll say one thing and that's it. We stop, that's it. We're okay, we'll, we'll talk about the, the water's hot, the water's cold and then wash, wash, wash and we're done. Thinking about how can we talk about all kinds of things happening throughout the day. These are routines you have to do anyway. You're doing this with your baby anyway. So let's talk about it. Let's give that baby language, uh, playtime, bedtime, Time in the car. We can talk about all kinds of things in the car. Um, if you got a child who's signing, you make your sign up here, or it's the ball. You turn your hand around. It's the ball. Oh, it's the ball. You know, one-handed signing. Deaf people do it all the time. Um, and then you can flip your mirror down and watch your baby in the back, or put another mirror up on your dash so you can kind of glance at your baby in the back. Um, nap time. Times, time outdoors. I mean, you live in Hawaii. You have the most beautiful place in the world to be outdoors. Um, so spending some time outdoors and then talking about transitions. Um, what I mean by that is, okay, you know, it's time we need to clean up because in a few minutes, we got to have bath time. So giving that child language to prep them for the transition that's going to happen next. Um, I remember hearing a story from a friend of mine who's deaf and She's one of 11 children and she is like the second from the last, but she said she just remembered her whole childhood. She was an, an auditory learner. She, was, she wore hearing aids and she didn't sign. They were, she was an oral, oral child, used oral language to communicate, but her mom would yell from downstairs. Okay, guys, go get your coats. We're gonna get in the car and go to grandma's house. Well, she didn't hear that because you know the distortion, the distance, all of that, she heard noise, but she didn't hear clearly what her mom had said. So she said the first you know, years of her life, really all she did was follow her siblings. She never had any idea where they were going. She would get, they'd pile into their van and she said her sister closest to her in age would usually sit next to her because they were good friends. And she would say, so where are we going? And her sister would fill her in. Um, she said, I never knew, I just followed my siblings. So remembering that when we have transitions or we're doing something, <clears throat> we have to make an effort if we're signing or if you're using spoken language or cued speech or any, whatever communication or language you're using, you have to make sure your child is accessing it. So child activities, and then don't forget about parent activities. So we can talk about what we're doing throughout the day. And if you've ever heard me present anywhere, you know, my favorite thing is laundry. Laundry is just the, the most amazing language experience in the world, right? So you do laundry, you have so many varieties of colors, sizes, textures. Uh, you have dirty, clean, soft, rough, um, scratchy. Um, you can fold, you can smell. What's it smell like? Is it warm? Is it dirty? Is it hot? There's just 
so much stuff you can talk about around laundry. It possessions, it's daddies, that's your brothers, that's your aunties. <clears throat> Who does this belong to? I mean, it's just amazing the amount of language around laundry time. Um, meal prep is also one of my favorites. I mean, every day we fix different foods. So you can talk about a zucchini, uh, this is a squash, this is um, pork, this is barbecue. Uh, let's taste it, let the baby taste it, feel it. All those experiences, those are real life experiences. What's that feel like? Um, giving, when you're making dinner or cooking in the kitchen, put your baby in the high chair and let them feel what cornmeal feels like. Oh, what's that? Let them taste, um, you know, whipping cream. Um, let them taste cherries or zucchini or carrots. Um, once they're old enough to have solid foods, of course, but um, let them feel it, taste it, touch it, experience it. It's a great way to build the brain and language. Uh, when you're cleaning, you're gardening, you're working on your car, fixing the car, um, lawn care, you're mowing the lawn or getting ready to give your toddler a, a little toy lawnmower and let them mow with you. Um, running errands. Tell your kids where you're going, what you're doing, why we're going there. Why, what are you thinking? Uh, when you do your exercises, let the baby join in. Let them do, play on the mat and roll around in circles while you're doing your yoga. Um, when you're doing work tasks, even buying, like I encourage parents right now during this COVID time, just go to your like, like local uh, consignment store or if you've got like a Salvation Army store and see if they have an old keyboard, computer keyboard that doesn't work anymore. Or if you have one stuck somewhere, let that baby play with the keyboard while you're working on your computer. So, and you can say, who are you writing a letter to? I'm writing a letter to my boss or I'm doing this. What are you doing? And let them, you know, engage. So they're having a good time. You're both, you're working, but you're engaging with them while you're engaging with your screen. And then again, transitions for you, transitions for parents. You know, you have five minutes and then we're going to go in the car and we're going to go to Costco or Walmart, whatever. So get ready. This kind of talking to your baby throughout the day, all day, what they're doing, seeing, feeling, hearing, experiencing. We talk about that. We basically what we call narrating the day. You're just narrating what you're doing, narrating what the baby's doing. That exposure to language helps build the brain. And then experiences. This is the thing that we, uh, right now, I think during COVID times, a lot of babies that have been born during this time or their first year of life was this year, they've missed out on a lot of experiences that other babies have just, you know, we just give to them because we're always on the go. So, our babies today need more experiences um, so we can go new places. Um, and here are some examples. Go to the beach. Um, you can do that during COVID days, keep your distance. Um, fa farmers markets, going to petting zoos, um, have a picnic, go to the planetarium, go to a park or a swimming pool um, or buy a little inexpensive swimming pool. Um, go to the nature center or an aquarium, just places that kids can see new things, experience new things, build new synaptic connections, um, and then talk about what you're seeing. Take pictures um, with your camera. Come back and build a book. If you go to the beach, we're going to have a, a, we'll take pictures, or you can come back and draw pictures. Just get a, a spiral notebook like this, you know? Doesn't have to be fancy. Kids don't care how fancy you draw. All they want is the engagement. What they really want is to be with you. So that interaction, you can draw pictures of the ocean, color it with crayons. Today we went to the ocean, next page. We saw surfers, next page. We played in the sand. Um, maybe bring some sand home and glue it to the piece of paper so the kids can feel and remember it. That kind of building a book around new places and things that we do, an experience book, actually helps kids to have constant exposure to language. So the more we repeat and talk about the book and talk about the book and talk about the book, what are we doing? 
creating those pathways, neurons shooting through the brain and developing language, early literacy skills, connecting real life to what's in print, very essential and lots of fun. And then experience new things, go fishing, um, get a baby thing, put them on your back or on your bicycle, go for a bike ride. Or you can have the, the if you run, the carriers that you can run with so the baby goes along with you. Um, go hunting for shells on the beach, gather flowers, <clears throat> take a walk outside and see what you can find. Um, you know, pieces of shells, pieces of flower, flower petals and feel them, experience them, smell them, talk about them. Um, watch a parade, uh, go dance, turn on the music and everybody in the family dances. That's fun, new experience. <clears throat> go camping, go swimming. All of these experiences build your baby's brain. These new places, experiences, and then finding a way to connect it back to their everyday life. Making a picture book, taking a picture, putting it on the wall. Um, all of these things build babies' experiences, builds their brain, provides them with new language. And then key, a key thing for all of our kids, especially babies who are deaf or hard of hearing, our babies who are deaf or hard of hearing, <clears throat> if we can give them exposure and help them love, fall in love with books and learn to read and write English well, we will neutralize their world. Reading is a great neutralizer for our deaf kids because they may not be able to speak English well. Um, maybe they can, but if they can read and write, there's really no limit to your academic success or your career success. If you can't read and write in English, whether you're deaf or hearing, you're gonna struggle. Reading and writing is a, an essential skill, especially for our deaf babies, deaf and hard of hearing babies. So we want every day to just expose your baby to print, have books around the house, keep magazines where they can get to them if you don't care if they get destroyed. Babies are gonna destroy any kind of paper you put in their way. But if you have magazines you've already read, Put them in a place where your baby can get to them so they have exposure to print. And then teach them, we don't tear books. We don't tear magazines. Um, they'll tear some in the process, but they'll learn how to care for a book. Read to your baby every day, every day. Read at some point as many times a day as you can. Um, let your baby see you reading. Even if you're not a good reader, um, Still, hold up a book or a magazine, look at the pages, look at the pictures. You don't have to read it. If you don't like to read or you don't read well, that's okay. You can look at the pages. The baby sees you engaging with reading materials. Babies who have exposure to reading materials in their first three years of life tend to be better readers and tend to write better and have better English skills. They also do better in school. So just the exposure alone. If you don't have money to get a lot of books, you can make your own books. They sell these. This is a, you know, a spiral bound notebook that I bought at, I buy them at Walmart at the start of every school year. You buy like five for a dollar, 10 for a dollar. I buy a dollar of them. You can, these are books. These become books. You can draw pictures in, in them. You can take cut pictures out of magazines and put them in a book and create books for your children to have exposure to write, writing materials and written materials all the time. Um, and let your baby see you writing. If you make a list, are you, I'm a list maker, I make lists for everything. But especially if I go shopping, I make a list. Or if you're doing a click list on your computer, let your baby engage. Okay, we need milk. Okay, let's type that in, milk, am I okay? You can use your computer. Um, let your baby play with writing materials, crayons, pencils, chalk, paper, um, even the, the computer keyboard like we talked about. Those are, are literacy materials that can be available to your baby 24-7. Um, and we want to have them where they have access to them. So they're constantly able to engage with printed materials. This is essential to your child's early development of literacy skills and language, English, really essential. And it's simple to do. 
If you don't have money for even these or books, go to the library. You can get a library card. Your child, I think it depends on the library, but here kids can get a library card at age two. And I take all my families to the library. They get a card and we go to library on a regular basis. A library is a great place to get books and exchange books and be able to read books and take them back and get new books. So there's uh, access to reading materials are everywhere. So these early experiences, you guys, early childhood is the most critical and at the same time, the most vulnerable time in a child's development. If they don't have these early experiences in life, the brain will not develop in the way we want it to. They will not be able to take advantage of their full capacity to use their noggin, their thinking, their, their brain. Um, so we, we want to give babies experiences. We want to basically cover them with language, um, let them touch, feel, experience that sensory play. You see this baby at the beach playing in the sand, that sensory play, playing with bubbles, getting in the water. We got a little surfer there, down there. Um, those experiences build the brain. That experience with touch, remember touch is so important. Not just people touching us, but that child touching things, experiencing textures, figuring out how things work. Um, that is all a part of early experiences and helps to develop the brain, grow the brain. In the first few years of life, all of the ingredients for your child's intellectual, so their intelligence, their emotional and moral growth are all laid down in the first three years of life. They're all established in that brain early, early on by these early experiences and the language exposure that your kids get during that time. So those, those experiences are essential. So we've already talked about this. Again, access to language is key. So they, you have these experiences that build the baby's brain. The language helps give them the ability to understand what they're doing, what they're experiencing, what is happening around them. And that language is the key that then leads to their later success academically. All right, so I, I can't emphasize enough how important experiences and interaction and engagement with your baby is. Those through the, that pillar is so important um, in developing your, your baby's brain and giving, allowing them to have exposure to all kinds of neuronal development, synaptic development. Um, I'll never forget, and before we leave this, I wanna uh, just share this, this idea because um, years ago, I mean, I've worked with babies forever and I, I just love babies. I love to watch how their brains work. But years ago, I went on my very first safari in Africa. Now, um, I am not a morning person at all. I'm a night owl. I tend to stay up till, you know, 12, one o'clock. Um, I have to get up for work the next day. But, you know, um, if I didn't, I would sleep in till, you know, seven, eight. Um, but, and I just am never like happy when I wake up. I'm just kind of a, I'm kind of not, a, a, I'm just kind of dead in the morning, right? I just, I'm existing. I can breathe, but I don't want anybody talking to me. I don't want to hear music. I don't want the TV on. I just am not a morning person. But when I went to Africa the first time, um, we got there and we went on a game drive that night. And um, I was just uh, blown away by what I saw, these animals, these wild animals just right there that I was watching. I was so excited, so stimulated, so intrigued by it, even though I'd seen animals on TV or whatever. But being there was a totally different experience, seeing them in the wild. I was just so, my brain was shooting neurons uh, like crazy. I was so excited, so amped up that the next morning, we, if you go on a safari, you have to be up at four o'clock the next morning uh, to get, because the animals come out at sunrise and sunset. That's when they mostly are active. And so you have to be up at four to get a little bit of breakfast and to get into the Jeep and get out into um, the Mara, the Masai Mara, onto the plains um, in time to see the animals. I was out, I was awake 
and out of bed at 345. I was so excited. I had my clothes on. I was ready to go. I was so excited. And it, as that whole experience was happening, I thought, you know, why? <laughs> why am I? Because that is not me. But I think that's how babies feel every day. Every day, when they see a new experience, they have to feel how I felt that day. That just alive. That, wow, that was so cool. Um, that was amazing what happened. It wakes up your body, your mind, your senses. And you can, I can actually feel my brain snapping. And I think that's what happens to babies. They can feel that excitement of seeing something new, doing something new, touching something different. Can you imagine your first experience with a blowing bubbles and you pop a bubble? How exciting that must be uh, for a child and a child's brain. So those experiences um, are essential. And as a teacher to provide fantastic experiences for our kids and for as a parent to think, What's this week? Can we do something new and different that maybe we haven't done before? Doesn't always mean you have to go out somewhere. You can do something at home that you've never done before. Okay, then the last one is a safe and consistent environment. This is the third pillar to provide um, good stimulation for brain development. So kids, they just need to feel safe and secure in order to grow. Love is part of that. Um, those experiences where they can, you know, engage in new things and having people around them that are safe and secure is essential. So they need to feel that in order to grow. If we if we don't feel safe, we can't learn. Um, if we don't feel supported, uh, you can't take a risk. And learning is a risk. Um, when your child feels stress, their brain development not just can be slowed; it will be slowed down. So. Children who are in crisis, um, maybe they have no food in their home. They feel this, their parents have lost their jobs. We have a lot of this going on right now. This is what we call toxic stress. And it actually can prevent your baby's brain from developing. Um, and it will definitely slow down that process. Um, consistent discipline also provides safe boundaries for your baby. Um, a lot of times parents think, well, she's deaf, so we're not going to really discipline her. She doesn't really understand. That's a mistake um, because our, all babies, they need discipline. I don't mean punishment. Okay, Discipline is not punishment. Discipline is teaching. So that baby goes and they, they pull, the, uh, pull the, the glass vase over and it's about ready to fall off. You catch that baby, you stop them and say, no, 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 we don't touch the glass face. The glass face will fall and break, okay? Instead, we can touch this. So we have to teach a baby that's a no-no. And you have to tell them that a lot of times, right? They don't just go, oh, okay, that's, I'm not supposed to do that, got it. No, they don't know what no means. <laughs> They're learning that too. So we have to use no, 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 face, hands. No, 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 we don't touch. Don't touch it. Um, and we give them something else to do. So we're teaching them instead of doing that, which we don't like, do this that we do like. Um, so setting those boundaries and saying, if you do that again, I'm taking your toy away. Then you have to take the toy away if they do it again. If you don't set those boundaries, if you aren't consistent with your discipline, Babies feel unsafe. I think we all think, well, he'll like it if he gets away with it. No, they don't. They feel unsafe inside and then they act out. That's why kids have tantrums. Um, sometimes they have them because they can't get what they want, right? They do. But if you set those boundaries, they eventually learn them and then they really, then they know I can go that far and I'm good. And so it, helps them to feel safe. It helps them to take risks. I can go that far, but I can't go further. Um, so that consistent discipline is key. And always remembering discipline isn't punishment. Discipline is teaching. And it takes a lot of work on the part of a parent and a teacher to teach what we want kids to do instead of disciplining them. Um, predictable routines, that's the next thing. If we have routines, 
throughout the day. Every day we do this and this and that. I'm not talking about it has to be at eight o'clock. No, I'm saying every day after we eat, we clean up the table. That's what we do. Or every day at six o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever, we sit down, we have dinner. Um, that is our routine. It doesn't have to be set to a time, but every day in the morning we have breakfast. Every day we get dressed. Every day we do this. Our routines are a little skiwampus. Okay, that's an old word, but they're a little crazy right now because of COVID. My routines today are not at all what they were two years ago. Um, no one's are, but we have different routines right now that we do. And so those predictable routines help your child know what to expect. And that helps them again, feel safe. When you're safe, you can learn. When you're safe, those synaptic connections happen. So I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say mom wakes up, she comes in, turns on the TV, that TV makes a noise and your baby is in the room next door and he's like just talking to himself. And he's like, this is, I, you know, I hear that, I don't know. Something's going on, oh look, there's my mom. She came in and helped me. She came and got me out of bed and I'm getting lots of love and attention. Okay, so let's say this happens every day, every day, predictable routine, mom gets up, she turns on the TV, that TV makes a noise, the baby's next door, in the room next door, he hears it. Over time, what happens? Okay, it'll happen again. Mom gets up, turns on the TV, makes a noise, baby's in his bed talking to himself, just cooing, waiting, hears that, and he goes, hey, I know what that sound means. That means someone's coming to get me pretty soon. I'm going and then all of a sudden, here she comes. Mom comes in, picks him up and cuddles. That's the benefit of a routine. You do the same thing every day. The baby starts with just, I don't even know what's going on. There's a sound, I don't know what it means. But over time, that TV turning on means in a few minutes, my mom's coming in to get me. So I'm gonna get ready. I'm gonna be excited. I can't wait for her to come. That kind of routine builds stability. And then in that routine, parents can begin to use language. And that language then becomes the first words that your baby understands. And then the first words that your baby uses because it happens every day in a consistent routine. Mom walks in, sings, good morning, good morning. Um, or says, oh, there's my baby. I love you so much. Let's give you some, whatever, whatever mom does, that language then becomes a part of the daily routine and part of the first words your baby will understand and then use. This happens all day throughout the day, then you're building a structure. You're basically building a house or a ladder for that language to be built on. So those consistent routines create a safe environment. Um, that means what? in everyday life, um, healthy, consistent meals. The baby has food on a regular basis. They have access to food. They have safe spaces to play in. So that means you, you can't sit from my chair or standing up and look and see if a room is safe for a baby. What you have to do is get on your hands and knees and on your belly and look around. I promise you, if we were in a training right now and I was, it was real life, I'd make you get on your stomachs or your knees right now. I'd make you get down on the ground. So we get off of the computer, get down on the ground and look around because the things we don't see from up here, cords, um, of course, electrical outlets, purses, um, boxes, maybe a pedal on your stationary bike. All of those things are dangerous things for a baby, but we don't recognize them unless we're down on their level. Okay, so you have to get down on the baby's level, look at what's safe and what isn't, and set up the environment so the room is safe. When the room is safe, then that baby is safe to explore, to go off, explore, experience without fear of getting into poisons or finding a pair of scissors or something sharp that he'll be cut with, you know, or whatever. The only way to know that is to get on the floor and see what they're looking at and remove it. Once that room is safe, then that baby can explore and have fun and learn. 
Um, same in your garage, in your backyard, wherever you are, you've got to baby safe that place. Um, and then they're safe to explore and learn new things, uh, new experiences, which builds the brain. Uh, babies need those consistent rules and then discipline and boundaries. Again, discipline is teaching. They need safe people. So sometimes we don't know if people are safe or not, right? But doing all we can to be sure that they are never left with a person who isn't safe is essential. And then sleep. Babies need lots of sleep. Children need a lot of sleep. We as adults need more sleep than we get. Sleep helps build the brain. Sleep allows myelinization. It allows the brain to grow. It allows our bodies to rest and recover and continue to learn. How much sleep? This is from the Sleep Council. It gives you an example that from one to 12 months of age, and you'll see different um, standards out there. I looked at lots of different things, but I stuck with the Sleep Council because I thought, well, they're the Sleep Council. Um, but anywhere from 14 to 17 hours a day for a baby, a newborn will sleep about 17 hours a day, the first month of life. Um, and then from one to 12 months old, 14 to 16 months, uh, hours a day, they'll sleep. Um, from one to three years old, anywhere from 12 to 15 hours a day, or 12 to 14, they sleep. Babies need a lot of sleep. Children need a lot of sleep. You, you think 700 synapses a second is happening in that baby's brain. That brain is active and running. It needs time to rest. It needs time to sleep. Children have to have set hours to sleep. Babies who are deaf or hard of hearing are often a little afraid at night because you take off their amplification, you turn off the light, they have no information coming in if they can't hear. So our babies may need a, they may need a little night light to get them through the night, um, but, they, but something very light so that they can still get, get good rest. Not a lamp by their bed, but maybe a little light in the um, socket that is just a little night light that gives them just a little aura of light um, might be necessary, but our babies need to rest. They need sleep. We need sleep. Um, so you can look at where you are and see, are you getting seven to nine hours of sleep a day? Very few people do. I don't. I know. And that harms our brains. So basically, inconsistency, a lack of discipline or inconsistent discipline, an unreliable environment or insecure environment or uh, a, an environment with lots of constant tension leads to conflict within a child. And that conflict is going to hurt. It's fully capable of hurting the child's brain development. So even if you're in a chaotic situation, trying to control the environment so your child has as much consistency and safety in their environment as possible is key. If you don't get it, kids can experience physiological changes. They can also have high blood pressure. They can have increased heart rate, um, stress hormones, cortisol, just like adults. For adults, it can lead to heart attacks or strokes. For children, what it does is prevent healthy brain development. So the lack of love, the lack of enriching, interactive, meaningful experiences, the lack, to, the lack of a safe and consistent environment, those three pillars, if they don't have all three, it will lead to poor brain development or could be, could. So I'm going to leave you with, well, there's a couple other slides, but uh, this is a three-year-old child. This are examples of three-year-old children. One who was raised in a normal, enriched, um, loving environment. They had all three pillars. They had a safe environment. They had love. And they had lots of experiences in interaction with adults and the world around them. The other brain is the brain of a child who had, this is extreme neglect. Uh, but you can see the lack of development in the brain. You can see the ridges around the outside of the brain. That just basically tells you that that um, 
that good uh, gray matter wasn't well developed in this child, child's brain. And you can see the big kind of holes in the brain. Um, that just means that information is not passing through those pathways like it should. So the impact of environment, the impact of those three pillars really does grow your baby's brain or prevents it from growing. So it is essential that we are attentive to that. So what you do with your child, how you communicate, how you interact, how you respond makes a difference in who they become. I'm gonna leave you with one final tip and I would have put this somewhere in the body of the presentation, but I just couldn't find where it fit best. So I'm gonna to talk to you just quickly about the evening meal or the family meal. Doesn't have to be an evening meal, but one very valuable thing you can do as a family is to at least four times a week, any meal every day, okay, four, times, four days out of the week, you have seven days, at least four of these, those days, if a family got together and had a, a family meal, any meal, the research shows that kids who have families who sit down to a meal at least four times a week have higher vocabulary, they get better grades, they do better academically in school, they have better overall health, they have a closer bond and relationship with their siblings and their parents and extended family. Uh, they're mo most like more likely to stay in touch with parents, even when they're teenagers, you know, and want to check in. And as a young adult, um, they're ten they tend to be less at risk for substance abuse and less at risk for teen pregnancy. And that's because you talk about things throughout your day. You talk about what you're doing, what you're feeling, what you experienced that day. Um, and everybody has a chance to do that. And you get to hear your parents' opinions, their feedback, their values. Remember, we're setting uh, a foundation for moral development, emotional development, academic development, and intelligence in these early years of life. If you have a child who's deaf or hard of hearing, the key is to make sure that child is fully included in those meals. Setting your, buying a round table so that you can see everyone around the table. Having rules so that before you talk, you raise your hand for a deaf child so they know who's talking or you get their attention. It's my turn, I'm gonna say something. Um, everyone signs or everyone talks. You make sure, did you understand me? Uh, we use a lot of understand me so that people get it. I grew up with deaf family members and we sat at a round table um, for that reason. So making sure deaf children are a part of every family event will build in them this sense of identity and who they are. And it is essential for brain development. Okay, we have eight minutes left. So I'm going to, let's see take your final questions and I'm gonna go out of this, stop sharing. And if you want, can you um, turn your cameras on? I know we're not supposed to do that, but um, I'd like to see who y'all are, if you're willing to turn on your cameras. Oh, good people, they're humans. All right, I love it. Okay, so do y'all have any questions? I think, um, Didi's going to read for me, I think, any questions that might have come in through the chat. Um, or if you have other questions, you can turn your, your mics on and just ask me directly. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, there was a question mentioned earlier, um, so we want to just address it from Julia Char. Did you want to ask the question or would you like me to read it? No, sure. You were talking about, um, you were talking about good sleep. And then you mentioned good fats. And that opinion of what a, what a good fat is seems to change every five years, right? So I was just curious what, what the opinion on good fats is these days. <laughs> well, what I read uh, about good fats right now are the omega-3 and omega-6 fats, right? So when you look at what your baby, baby foods are made of, you know, some of the things they put in to give it texture like flat seed, um, chia seed, um, trying to think, um, hemp, things like that. You, you wanna see if those things are in your baby's foods. Avocado is a healthy fat. 
that um, actually blends well with baby foods. It gives it a creamy texture and you can give your baby a little bit of avocado. Um, I put avocado in smoothies, you know, so for children, you can put fruit and um, some milk or soy or whatever. And then a little bit of avocado gives it a really smoothie, delicious texture. Uh, yogurt is considered a healthy fat with, made with whole milk. Um, that whole milk, if a child doesn't have lactose intolerance, um, soybean and canola oils are both good healthy fats. Um, like, you know, if you cook with those. And then of course the fish, you know, your cold water fish, mackerel, right. um, salmon, tuna, uh, those kinds of fish are really uh, filled with good healthy fats that help the brain. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. That's off the top of my head. We could probably do a search on it, but yeah. Any other questions? How many of you are parents of children who are deaf or hard of hearing? Oh, y'all are all, okay. One or two of you. So I hope this was helpful. This was really geared to parents. I hope it was um, a helpful thing. So, okay, I'm seeing, does cortisol evaporate when given loving consistent routines and interactions? No, cortisol is with us no matter what, but what will happen is the level of cortisol will drop. So our body will produce less once a child's giving that, but they'll still have like when a baby's learning to walk, they still have their cortisol levels will shoot up because they're learning something new. It's like, uh, for me, example, I went, I, I hate needles. So, but I was lucky enough to get my vaccine, but my cortisol levels were through the roof the day I went, drove in to get my vaccine. I felt like I was like back at age five or six having to go get a shot. I hate needles. I was actually sick to my stomach. That's how I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it's true. Um, but let me just tell you, if you haven't gotten your vaccine, I didn't even feel it. I didn't feel it. But it's your cortisol levels still still go up and down. Uh, but if you have a healthy, loving environment, you, you may have an elevated cortisol level when you're doing something new, but it will come back down quickly and it will stay down. Kids who are in really stressful environments, that cortisol level stays up at a high level long-term that prevents neuron, neuronic development happening. Other questions? How are your cortisol levels during this pandemic? <laughs> Have you found ways to deal with your own cortisol levels, your own stress? Yes, some of you. So it's important for us to do that too, especially as teachers, providers, uh, the stress of doing things online, it's very stressful. Like today, I think my stress level was pretty high today. My cortisol levels, if you measured them, they'd probably be pretty high because I, I, if I could have seen y'all all day like this, I'd have been fine. But just me talking to a screen, I was just like, um, so I'm sure if they measured my cortisol right now, I'd you know, kind of be shooting through the roof. So when we finish, I'm going to go for a walk because I'll feel better. I'll bring my cortisol right back down. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay, catch and return. Yes, okay, the question is, can I go over again how we can explain the idea of catch and return? When I teach this to parents, I bring a ball in and I just say, you know, can you sit on the ground with me? We're just going to play. Uh, ball. Now throw the ball, roll it back, throw the ball, roll it back. That's where I begin the conversation. When I'm talking about catch and return, this is catch and return. When I roll it to you, you catch, you return it back. So we take that activity that we're all, you know, comfortable with, and then we put it into a language, reframe it into language to say, okay, if I say to you, oh, hey, I love your shirt. Are you going to respond back? Yeah, what are you going to say? Oh, thank you. Right, so how can I return? So I caught that, then I'm going to return. What am I going to say? Where did you buy that? Um, or whatever. So you just give them an idea of that catch and return just with a regular conversation. Say, okay, uh, tell me about your day. What did you do today? Then they respond back. 
oh, really? I saw that on TV. How did that go? And they respond back. Then you just step back and say, okay, that conversation we just had, that's a catch and return. I say something, you catch, you throw it back. With your baby, it might be an action first. You know, um, like, you know, they see the bottle and they their, their feet start to kick. And that's their their throw, that's their return or their start, their initiation. So I catch that. I see those feet kicking. Are you excited to see grandma or whatever? And then we wait, see what the baby does. Maybe they'll smile. Ah, yeah, you're excited. I see that smile. Let's go see grandma. Or you want to, let me pick you up. And you do this, right? And then you wait. What do you wait for? The baby to raise their hands or smile or engage in some way. Does that help? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No other questions. Okay. Um, just, I'm putting actually in the chat box right now, uh, evaluation form. If anybody does need a certificate, um, go ahead and fill out at the very end. They're going to ask you for an email um, and then they'll send you the link for if anybody needs a certificate for today's presentation. Um, we'd just like to thank uh, Paula Pittman from Sky High Institute. Thank you so much. And Hands and Voices. Um, of course, our sponsors, CSC and NHSP. And everyone who attended today. I know I missed some people. They logged off already. But thank you so much. It was such a wonderful presentation. I was totally engaged. <laughs> Great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned a nugget. I mean, some of you already know this stuff, but if you can walk away from any presentation with a nugget or two, that's a good thing. So I hope you learned a nugget or two. All right, you guys, thanks so much. And follow the video. Um, if you could throw the link in before everybody. Oh, yes. Let me, um, let me get back into my... PowerPoint, just give me one second and I'll copy in. This is at uh, zero to three. So if you're if you're not familiar with zero to three, um, I would really recommend that you get on their website. They have a wonderful website. It just has all kinds of great stuff. And this is just a quick little, uh, like four, it's about four and a half minutes um, about the, the brain, but there's all kinds of good stuff at the zero to three website. So I'll go ahead and put this in the chat right now. And then you can go in and watch it. Sorry, we didn't have time today, but you can watch it on your own. Just as good. Okay, I think that's there. Let me see if it goes through. Yep. Excellent. All right, you guys, uh, go enjoy Hawaii. I wish I was there, although it's going to be 53 degrees today. So we're like thrilled. This is the warmest day we've had in forever. So um, I'm going for a walk and it's sunny. Yay. So y'all enjoy the surf for me though. All right. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for your attention.